So building on post-impressionism, many artists in the early 20th century felt that art was meant to come from within the artist rather than from the external visual world, and they explored the expressive potential of exaggerated brushwork and bold colors. The term expressionism refers to art in which the image of reality is distorted in order to make it expressive of the artist's inner feelings or ideas. It was really a growing international movement rather than a singular unified style or group. And it really sort of begins with Van Gogh during post-impressionism and then continues to develop throughout the 20th century. The term expressionism can be applied to artworks from any era, just the same as how lowercase realism can be applied to works from any era, but like capital R realism refers to specifically the movement that began in France in the 1840s, capital E expressionism refers more precisely to the 20th century, and it's most specifically associated with modern German art. Uh, the term was first used by German art critics of this era before it was retroactively applied to the art of several other eras. So sometimes to differentiate, art historians will use the term German Expressionism. So in the early 20th century, Germany um, Expressionism was developing largely in response to the rapid and intensive industrialization and urbanization of the country, which resulted in social and political tensions. Many artists responded by conveying emotions through provocative images of modern society. Now, like the avant-garde artists in France, German artists were also drawn to ideas of primitivism. The Expressionists saw African and Oceanic art as direct reflections of unconscious impulses, and they appropriated their techniques of distorting nature as a means of expressing strong feelings and metaphysical concepts. They admired folk art, the art of children, and medieval German sculpture and prints as well, because these also deviated from naturalism. They associated what they considered to be these primitive distortions with vitality and the expression of immediate, unfiltered emotions. Now, there were several independent expressionists in Germany during this time, but for the sake of time, we as a class are just going to look at the two self-defined groups, Die Bruck and Der Blau Reiter. Um, and both of these are particularly emblematic of German expressionism before and then immediately after World War I. So around 1905, a group of Dresden-based artists joined together as Die Bruck, or The Bridge. Their name was taken from a passage written by the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, he said, quote, What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not an end. This group saw the potential for contemporary humanity, or themselves, to serve as a bridge to a more perfect society in the future. These artists adopted traditionally Northern European media like woodcuts and oil paints, and they used distorted forms and jarring colors to communicate emotional tension in intense and even brutal expressionistic images of alienation and anxiety. Now some of their favorite motifs included the natural world and the nude human figure, underscoring their support for the growing desire in Germany to reconnect with nature. Many citizens left cities in favor of more remote areas during this time, and the concept of nudism was also a growing cultural trend in Germany during those years. Members of Die Bruck spent summers at lakes near Dresden in northern Germany, enjoying an idyllic, creative, free-loving, communal existence. For their first exhibition in 1906, one of the founding members, um, Fritz Bleil, he designed this expressionistic woodcut poster featuring a partially abstracted nude woman, which reflects the group's attitudes towards open sexuality and the natural state of nudity. The expressionist interest in woodcut printing was largely due to the natural quality of the materials and the simplicity of the final product. They fused woodcut with primitivist ideas, developing a deliberately crude style. 
Eric Heckel radically flattened compositions by dispensing with fine details and nuanced shading, relying instead on harsh splintered lines, distortions of forms, and extreme contrasts of black and white, or broad areas of bold color. The print seen here on the left, Standing Child from 1910, uses just three colors to present a rather highly stylized but expressive image of a naked young girl whose flesh is the color of the paper itself, isolated against broad areas of pure black, green, and red. She stares out at the viewer with this confident, somewhat coy expression. She's the ideal child of new society, innocent yet wise. Now, knowing that this was modeled after a 12-year-old girl named Franzi Furman makes the image maybe a bit uncomfortable. Um, Franzi, along with her siblings, modeled for the group quite often to provide financial support for their family. And it's uncomfortable to consider that Eric Heckel or some of these other artists were sexualizing this 12-year-old child, but maybe they weren't necessarily doing that. The nudity that they saw was kind of considered to be the most natural state of humanity, and they associated it with the purity of humanity in the Garden of Eden. And so in this way, nakedness isn't sinful or even inherently sexual, but rather pure and natural. Now, some of Heckel's other works, however, like this one on the right, which is titled On the Beach or the Bathers from 1923, here he seems to mix this idea of pure, innocent nudity with a greater degree of sexuality and eroticism. Here we have two adult women bathing in this sort of mountain landscape. And so, again, maybe we could read this as bridging the gap between nature and humanity um, and sort of referencing the purity of nudity within the Garden of Eden, but notice how even if the women's actual bodies are not necessarily overly sexualized, the shadows here are more sort of exaggerated and kind of emphasize the erotic sexuality of the nude female figure. And so in some ways here, Heckel has kind of incorporated primitivist ideas and has seemingly referenced the presumed overt sexuality of primitive peoples that modern society had really bypassed. Emile Nold joined the group a little bit later, in about 1906, but he quickly became the most committed member. He had originally trained in industrial design and briefly studied academic painting. He regularly visited um, ethnographic museums in Paris, in Germany, and across Europe, really, to study the arts of Africa and Oceania. Um, he was especially impressed by the, quote, radical and forceful visual presence of the human figure, especially in African masks. Um, he later said that he was attracted to the, quote, native art of Pacific cultures because of their primitivism, their, quote, absolute originality, the intense and often grotesque expression of power and life in very simple forms. This 1911 work, which he's simply titled Masks, is really the embodiment of these primitivist concerns. He uses bold colors and vigorous brushwork to create this heightened sense of energy and emotional intensity of these roughly drawn masks with gaping mouths and hollow eyes um, that seemingly sort of float and advance through space against this very expressive um, dark background. The masks here seem to reference various cultural traditions. Um, so the central yellow one here seems to be inspired maybe by European carnival or masquerade masks. And then to the far left, this red sort of irregular crescent shaped mask in profile, this was likely inspired by a carved wooden prow of a Solomon Islands canoe, while the rather grotesque looking face in the lower corner uh, to the right here was inspired by a shrunken head of a Yorana man, which had been acquired from the Mundaraka people of Brazil. And so along with that Solomon Islands canoe prow, um, this shrunken head was in the Berlin Museum of Ethnology, where Nold had studied and sketched quite a bit. 
And so he's, again, kind of combining various cultural traditions, appropriating um, kind of stylistic techniques, and then also boldly juxtaposing complementary colors to increase both the visual and emotional intensity here. And then by merging the sort of you know, variously appropriated forms, he creates this ghoulish scene full of wild, ominous urgency and maybe a sense of fear and even violence. So during the summer of 1911, instead of communing with nature, the members of Die Bruck moved to the city, to Berlin, where they produced powerfully critical images of urban society before ultimately disbanding in 1913. Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, who'd been a member of the group since its inception, wrote, quote, It was one of the loneliest times of my life, during which an agonizing restlessness drove me out onto the streets day and night. So Kirchner continued to produce expressive street scenes that really harshly critiqued modern life and explored the psychological experience of the individual in an overcrowded urban metropolis. In his 1913 Street Berlin, which is on, um, on the left here, he depicts two prostitutes in fur-lined cloaks and large feathered hats strutting past these bourgeoisie men on the street. Um, they are quite glamorous, yet they're also meant to be representative of urban degeneration and alienation. The women are dehumanized with almost mask-like faces and stiff gestures, while the men, their potential clients, have hard, unwelcoming faces. All of the bodies in the composition sort of crowd together physically, but they're quite psychologically distant from one another. On the right, we have his 1914 Potsdamer Plots, which is quite similar, but it's depicting a more sort of specific, identifiable place. Potsdamer Plots was one of the most important shopping areas in Berlin during the day, but at night it became a place where prostitutes came out to find and kind of solicit their clients. Um, so here we have the two women standing on a sort of traffic island, which becomes somewhat like a pedestal that uh, would maybe support a sculpture or that you might see in a department store window, um, maybe revolving so that viewers can kind of see the outfits on the mannequins from every angle. Um, there's this sort of posing, almost haughty quality, particularly to um, the woman in blue kind of uh, looking towards the viewer there. But again, both women have rather mask-like faces that really drain them of their individuality. The street in this composition is this greenish color which creates a sort of nightmarish effect, and there's this pervading sense of danger. Um, in both of these scenes, the jarring colors, tilted perspective, and bold brushwork help intensify the anxiety and the excitement of the scene, depicting the modern city as a place where both glamour and danger, intimacy and alienation can coexist, and where ultimately everything and everyone is for sale. Now, additionally, Kirchner really believed that art should come from direct experience. And so his street scenes like these are generally inspired by things he saw and people he met while roaming around the city. Um, so in both of these compositions, for example, the models for these two women were um, some sisters, Erna and Gerard uh, Schilling. Um, they were two dancers that he had met at a Berlin nightclub, um, again, while he was sort of roaming around the city. Now, two years after Die Brücke had disbanded, and after the start of World War I, Kirchner painted this self-portrait as a soldier in a characteristically expressive style. The nightmarish image conveys a neurotic psychological state, not a real event, um, but it expresses Kirchner's fears of serving in the German army and his anxieties about the war's potential to damage his identity as an artist. Um, he's imagined himself here dressed in a military uniform with a bloody stump on his right arm, standing in his studio in front of a nude model. 
The elongated figures are composed of jagged forms, the background space is warped, and the intense color palette includes fiery reds, sickly yellows, and cold blues. And the artist's eyes are somewhat blurred, and his face is quite gaunt, almost again mask-like, as if it's been carved from wood, perhaps. Now, the other self-defined group of German Expressionists was a sort of larger, looser group of artists formed in Munich by the Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky and a German artist named Franz Mark, along with a few others. Um, they called themselves Der Blau Rider, or the Blue Rider. Um, the name was really inspired by this image of St. George um, on the city emblem of Moscow, in which he wears this blue cloak, and Kandinsky had sort of adopted it as a pretty common motif in his works. St. George had been a spiritual leader in the city, and so the Blue Rider aspired to offer spiritual leadership in the arts. The group felt the blue was sort of a spiritual color, and that the rider also really connected to Franz Marc's love of horses, and so together it sort of served as this symbol of forward progress. The blue rider really transforms into a metaphor for this group of artists' um, practices and the ways that they sought to move beyond realistic representation and kind of transition from the tangible world to the spiritual realm. Um, so once again, the artists involved in this group had rather highly individualized styles, but they were really united by their passionate belief in the creative freedom of the artist to express their personal vision however they felt was appropriate. Um, the group in general was interested in abstraction, symbolic content, and spiritual illusion. So Franz Marc was a key member of this Blue Rider group, and he pursued the spiritual and the mystical. He was actually originally a theology student, and he used painting as a spiritual activity. By about 1911, he was mostly painting animals rather than human figures, rendering them with these big, bold forms and highly saturated colors. He loved animals, especially horses, and he really felt that they were more primitive and thus more pure than humans, with a greater spiritual connection to nature. Um, again, he used animals, especially horses, as symbols of spiritual renewal, and he typically tried to depict them and kind of view them as if he himself were emotionally and physically inseparable from them. Um, in this work from 1911, titled Large Blue Horses, he's really tried to integrate the animals into the landscape. The rounded contours of their big blue bodies kind of echo that of the hills in the background, really suggesting that these animals live in complete harmony with their surroundings. His 1913 work, Fate of the Animals, on the other hand, is a rather intense, apocalyptic scene of supernatural color and geometrically fragmented forms. Um, I think you can absolutely get a sense of the stylistic influence that Cubism is having at this point in time. Um, but I think that Mark is maybe also thinking about the impending war. Uh, the composition here depicts um, a blue deer kind of in the center looking up at this huge falling tree. And then we also see some other animals uh, kind of scattered around. So the blue deer is kind of in the center with its head thrown up um, looking at this huge falling tree. Um, remember that the group um, considered the color blue to be a sort of spiritual and hopeful color, but here it's about to be sort of crushed. Um, we've also got some foxes kind of over here to the right. Um, we've got some red cattle down here in the lower left corner, and then kind of up beyond them we have these green horses that seem to be sort of maybe fighting with one another. Um, an inscription on the back of this rather chaotic composition reads, quote, all being is flaming suffering. And this sort of reflects Marx's disillusionment with the state of the world at the time. 
In a 1915 letter to his wife, he wrote that he had begun to see the ugliness in animals, which he had previously thought had only existed in human beings. He also wrote that he was starting to recognize animals as a part of the human world that really needed redemption. And he saw war as a means of this redemption, as a means to sort of purify society and um, the universe of everything that was bad. And so I think this composition um, sort of illustrates the destruction that he felt was necessary for renewal. Um, the discoloration that you can sort of see on the right side of the canvas here, this is actually some damage. Uh, the painting was, I believe, in a small fire at some point, which is perhaps a little bit ironic. Um, it's also perhaps ironic that um, Franz Marc so enthusiastically supported the war and he enlisted in the German army in 1914, only to die by 1916. So Vasily Kandinsky was from a wealthy Moscow family, and he was actually a lawyer before he moved to Munich to pursue a career as a modern artist. He was really the one who organized the Blue Rider group. Kandinsky believed that art should express inner spiritual necessity rather than the outward visible content of reality. He also argued that color and form had concrete spiritual values, and he was really one of the first to explore purely abstract compositions. Like Whistler, he gave many of his works musical titles like composition and improvisation, and he aspired to make paintings that responded to his own inner state and were entirely autonomous, making no reference to the visible world. Between 1911 and 1914, he produced a series of increasingly abstract works, including both of these canvases, Improvisation 28 and Improvisation 30, subtitled Canons. Um, the chaotic energetic forms here reflect the turmoil of the time leading up to World War I, but they don't necessarily reference specific events or forms. Um, you can maybe pick out the remnants of architectural forms or landscapes, even figures perhaps, but he again wasn't trying to create an accurate rendering of the physical world. In fact, he saw um, such realism as a quote, misguided materialist quest, and he argued that art does not have to have a narrative or a subject to evoke something in humanity. So throughout his career, Kandinsky becomes increasingly abstract, and he really idealistically promoted abstract art as a transnational movement that could rise above general or national or ethnic origins. He really hoped that his paintings would lead humanity to a deeper awareness of spirituality and their own inner world. He sort of asks his viewers to equate their visual experience of art to the auditory experience of music and to respond to his paintings as if listening to a symphony, first instinctively and spontaneously to the individual parts and then to the entire experience as a whole. In 1912, he published a book titled Concerning the Spiritual in Art, in which he wrote, quote, Color influences the soul. Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand that plays, touching one key or another purposefully to cause vibrations in the soul. So early 20th century Italy was really in a state of crisis. They had only been unified as a country since about 1871, and huge disparities of wealth and privilege were prominent across the country. Four-fifths of Italy's population was illiterate, and poverty and hunger were rampant. In about 1909, the first organized Italian avant-garde movement emerged, Futurism. An Italian poet, Filippo Marionetti, published The Foundation and Manifesto of Futurism in 1909, in which he denounced the classical past of Italian culture in favor of embracing modernity in order to revive the country. His manifesto declared, quote, We will destroy museums, libraries, and fight against moralism, feminism, and all utilitarian cowardice. 
So really, he's attacking everything old, dull, and quote-unquote feminine, and encouraging new, masculine, futuristic, modern world objects and forms. Additionally, he said, quote, we want to glorify war, the only cure for the world. And so again, they saw war as sort of this social cleansing agent, and they hoped that the agitation and destruction would really end the current status quo and allow for the regeneration of a stronger, more energized Italy. In 1911, a group of artists followed with the technical manifesto of Futurist Painting in which they stated, quote, We declare that the splendor of the world has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. They also said, quote, All subjects previously used must be swept aside in order to express our um, wiling life of steel, of pride, of fever, and of speed. A key tenet of the futurist philosophy was that creative expression should represent the dynamism of the early 20th century's fast-paced industrial age. They depict products of industrialization and technology, especially things like automobiles and trains, military technology, electricity, etc. But most of all, they were truly obsessed with ideas of speed and motion, and they sought to create dynamic representations of objects in rapid motion using static materials. Um, in many ways, futurism builds on cubism because these artists tend to break down visual forms into rather simplified or essential geometric parts, but they were much more interested in motion and dynamism than the cubists ever were. Um, so the image seen here by Gino Severini is Armored Train in Action from about 1915. Uh, Severini was probably the futurist who was most um, kind of supportive of the idea of war as a social agent. Um, this image was probably based on a photograph of a Belgian armored train going over a bridge. We observe the scene from a rather radically tilted perspective, essentially looking at it from above. Um, I think you can definitely see the influence of cubism here with the jagged, kind of fragmented and splintered forms and the overlapping surfaces, but the vivid colors and the dynamism that's conveyed are quite different, ultimately communicating a rather chaotic scene of smoke, violence, loud cannon and gun blasts, and of course, the force of the speeding train as it races through the rich green plant life. So the futurist painter Giacomo Bala was a prominent member of the group, and while he was interested in motion, speed, and light, he was actually really less interested in machines and violence than many of the others. Um, instead, his works tend to be rather witty and even whimsical in a lot of cases. Um, on the left here, we have a work from Bala um, from about 1912 titled The Dynamism of a Dog on a Leash. This really illustrates the artist's efforts to visualize movement with static media, and it almost illustrates a specific part of the Futurist Manifesto, which states, quote, All things move, all things run, all things are rapidly changing. Moving objects constantly multiply themselves. A running horse has not four legs, but twenty. Um, Bala was interested in chronophotography, which was this photographic technique where multiple photographs were taken in rapid succession to capture the movement of a subject. Essentially, this was early time-lapse photography, like what we saw with um, Edward Muybridge's Galloping Horse. So Bala implies motion in his paintings by dissolving the contours of forms and repeating them across space to depict the successive positions. Uh, the feet of the woman, the leash, and the dog's body, from nose to tail here, are all blurred and repeated. Notice how the woman's shoes sort of dissolve into this dashed pattern, and how the swinging leash catches the light in four distinct moments, and how even the flopping dog's ears are sort of captured as he trots along here. The lively background with the vibrating and contrasting streaks of pink and green is sometimes interpreted as um, representing white dust kind of shimmering under bright sunlight. To enhance the impression of speed within this painting, um, Bala has painted the ground using uh, sort of angled or diagonal lines. 
Um, on the right, we have another canvas titled Streetlight from about 1909 to maybe 1911. And it is another sort of demonstration piece for the futurist movement. Um, here, Bala rejects traditional subject matter and instead has painted an object that is forthrightly modern and technological. One of the new electric street lamps that had just been installed at this time in Rome where Bala lived. The introduction of electrified city lighting was very exciting during this period of time um, and it kind of symbolized uh, the technological advancements of modernity and it was also a powerful symbol of how the ancient city of Rome was finally abandoning its past and kind of entering into the modern age. And so Bala uses obvious bold brush strokes in this uh, repeated V-shaped pattern to illustrate the light and energy that are radiating from the lamp. The saturated colors range from almost blinding white and yellow at the center of the lamp to cooler hues farther from the light's bulb. Um, in the 1910 manifesto of the Futurist group, this work is showcased as a superb example of their subjects and styles, and the group really exalted it, saying, quote, electric lamp which spasmodic starts shrieks out the most heart-rending expressions of color. Umberto Boccioni was one of the leading artists among the Italian futurists. This work from 1913, Dynamism of a Soccer Player, demonstrates a principle that Boccioni articulated in the 1910 Technical Manifesto of Futurist Painting. He said, quote, To paint a human figure, you must not paint it. You must render the whole of its surrounding atmosphere. Movement and light destroy the materiality of bodies. So in this work, we have a soccer player which dematerializes into a luminous and flickering atmosphere, save the kind of firmly sculpted calf in the center of the composition. With stifled brushwork and kaleidoscopic color, the painting communicates the spirited energy of a youthful athlete. Um, Boccioni creates this dynamic sensation through abstracted shapes that are both transparent and opaque and that overlap each other, kind of clearly giving us that influence of cubism. It doesn't really matter that there is no recognizable soccer player here because that's not truly the subject. Instead, it is the soccer player's dynamism, their movement, their exertion, their speed. And that is conveyed through the sort of almost chaotic forms that uh, kind of move across the canvas. And likewise, the viewer's eyes are constantly moving and never really resting on one spot or another. In 1912, Boccioni argued for a futurist sculpture of environment in which form should explode in a violent burst of motion from the closed and solid mass of the surrounding space. His sculpture, Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, brings together the movement of the striding figure with that of the displaced air around the figure. Boccioni believed in a concept that he called plastic dynamism, and he thought that this could be achieved by synthesizing relative motion, or motion in relation to a surrounding environment, and absolute motion, or the dynamism that is inherent to the object. Now, unlike other futurists like Bala, who sought to depict motion through repeated limbs and forms, Boccioni wanted to create singular forms that expressed movement. Unique forms of continuity in space presents an ideal human-machine hybrid, forcefully and confidently striding through space, away from the past and toward the future. There's this interesting juxtaposition of hard edges and sharp angles with more organic flowing areas on the shoulders and the legs. In some ways, these forms seem to mimic human flesh flowing under the force of motion. Like if you were to use a really strong automatic hand dryer in a restroom um, and you know how your skin sort of wiggles around underneath that force. Um, also, the dynamic curves here sort of create this undulating rhythm that really sculpts the air that's been displaced by the figure's forms and movement. 
Now Boccioni, he originally created this out of plaster, and it was only cast in bronze after his death. But the shiny material really resembles machinery or maybe armor, um, especially on the head of the figure where it kind of looks like he's wearing a helmet. And so this further connects it to the futurist ideas of industrialization, technology, and war or violence. Um, Boccioni was another artist who rather enthusiastically supported the war, um, and he more specifically supported Italy's entrance into World War I by enlisting, um, and then he later died during his military service. So in France, Cubism influenced Robert Delaney and his Ukrainian-born wife, Sonia Delaney, quite directly, but they took the nearly monochromatic static forms of Cubism in new directions, incorporating bright lozenges and swirls of highly saturated color. The art critic Guillerme Aponier labeled their works as Orphism after the ancient Greek poet Orpheus who had tamed wild beasts with his lute, implying that their art had a similar power. The Delaney's themselves preferred the term simultaneity, a concept based on Chevrolet's law of simultaneous contrast, and they sought to, quote, create harmony out of a disharmonious world through the combination of modernity and spirituality. Robert Delaney combined his interests in cubist forms, fauvist colors, and the deep spirituality of the Blue Rider group to create celebrations of modern life and technology. His 1914 work seen here, Homage to Blaireau, is a tribute to the French pilot Louis Blaireau, who was the first person to fly over the English Channel in 1909. Delaney portrays the plane flying over the Eiffel Tower, a symbol of Parisian modernity, and he's using rather brightly colored circular forms to suggest the movement of the propeller, the blazing sunlight, and the huge rose window of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which links Delaney's ideas of progressive science, modern machinery, and spirituality. His wife, Sonia Delaney, also produced Orphist paintings, but she also designed fabric patterns and dress designs that were quite similar to her paintings. Um, at the 1925 International Expo of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts, she exhibited a line of inexpensive, ready-to-wear clothing which she called simultaneous dresses. She also decorated a Citroen sports car to match one ensemble for the exhibition. Uh, she viewed both the car and her clothing designs as symbols of the new age because they had both been designed inexpensively for mass production and with the newly independent modern woman in mind. Other French artists were also fascinated with technology and machinery, as well as cubist forms and fauvist colors. Purism was a post-cubist group that developed in Paris um, with the painter Amade Alzenfant and the Swiss artist and architect Le Corbusier in their 1925 book, The Foundation of Modern Art. Disillusioned with Cubism, which they felt had become too decorative, they argued for a return to clear ordered forms and ideas to express the efficient clarity of the modern machine age. They were inspired by the purity and beauty they found in machine forms, as well as rationality and order. They believed classical numerical formulas and mathematically derived proportions and arrangements would help create a sense of harmony and joy. And perhaps they were kind of thinking about achieving a more rational kind of orderly society in response to the very chaotic horrors of World War I. In a 1921 essay, Le Corbusier wrote, quote, We think of the painting not as a surface, but as a space, an association of purified, related, and architectural elements. Purist subjects are similar to that of the Cubists, relatively neutral things like everyday objects, musical instruments, and even sometimes figures, but usually they present them in more recognizable ways than the Cubists did. 
Fernand Laguerre was associated with purism, and he was really fascinated with technology and machine forms. His 1921 work titled Three Women is a purist machine age version of the academic subject of the reclining female nude figure. His women here are rather dehumanized with identically bland round faces. Their bodies are constructed with large machine-like shapes arranged in an asymmetrically geometric grid, which sort of creates this sense of classical stability and order, but maybe also evokes the modern orderly arrangements of machinery parts. The bright colors and patterns also suggest a lively yet orderly modern industrial society where everything is new and everything has its own place. In early 20th century Russia, avant-garde artists known as Cubo-Futurists claimed to be inspired by both movements, exploring ideas of technology and speed while moving increasingly towards abstraction. For example, Natalia Goncharova's 1913 electric light depicts the bright artificial light of a new electric lamp fracturing and dissolving its surrounding forms. Here we seem to have a more sort of organic or curvilinear set of forms than what we see in Picasso and Brock's cubism, and a softer, more natural sense than the hard machine-like forms and blurred motion of futurism. In 1913, Goncharova and her husband, Mikhail Larinov, launched Rayanism, or Rayism, with a manifesto that claimed their paintings, quote, depict not objects, but the intersection of rays of light reflected from them. Goncharova's Rayanist dancer of 1916 reflects her futurist interests in motion and speed, while the sharp angular forms and colorful diagonal lines convey both a cubist fracturing of space and the light as it reflects off the forms. Another Russian avant-garde named Kazimir Malevich invented suprematism, an art of pure geometric abstraction between about 1913 and 15. He remembered, quote, in the year 1913, in my desperate attempts to free art from the burden of the object, I took refuge in the square form and exhibited a picture which consisted of nothing more than a black square on a white field. Malevich believed that the making and reception of art was an independent spiritual activity, divorced from any notions of political, utilitarian, or social purpose. He tried to express this rather mythical sensation with purified forms and colors, and he tried to make art that created its own world rather than depicting the real world or kind of our own reality. He described his famous black square as the zero of form and the white background as the void beyond this feeling. His earlier works stick to pretty basic geometric forms such as circles, squares, lines, and rectangles painted in a limited range of colors floating weightlessly in a white space representing infinity. In some of his later works, he begins to incorporate more complicated shapes and a broader range of colors and shadows, creating an illusion of space and movement. In the early 20th century, we finally start to see sculpture undergoing an avant-garde revolution that is just as profound as that of painting. And one of the most prominent avant-garde sculptors during this time was the Romanian artist Constantine Brancusi, who had settled in Paris in 1904, where he had immediately become interested in the quote-unquote primitive art on display. He rejected superficial realism, and he was especially interested in the semi-abstracted forms of non-Western art traditions because he felt they captured the essence of their subject. He wrote, quote, what is real is not the external form, but the essence of things. Starting from this truth, it is impossible for anyone to express anything essentially real by imitating its exterior surface. He was inspired by Romanian folk art, African art, and the work of mo other modern artists. Um, and usually he drew forms from nature, but he tends to radically simplify them, often beyond recognition, to the point of non-objectivity. 
For example, this 1915 work titled The Newborn is a rather perfect, organic, abstract ovoid inspired by an egg, which Brancusi saw as a symbol for the potential of birth, growth, and development, uh, really containing the essence of life. This work conflates the shape of an egg with that of the head of an infant human to suggest the essence of humanity at the moment of birth. In his 1924 Torso of a Young Man, Brancusi simplifies the torso and upper legs of a figure into three highly polished metal cylinders with machine-like regularity. Your textbook points out that the somewhat phallic nature of this form is potentially meant as a rather sexually charged symbol of essentialized masculinity. The form has a sense of gravity and stillness, especially when perched atop the raw earthiness of the wood and stone pedestal here. Brancusi often liked to juxtapose the sleek modern materials of his sculpted forms with more natural or quote-unquote primitive ones like wood and stone for the pedestals. One of his most well-known works is on the right here. Um, he created it originally in 1923. It's titled Bird in Space, and it presents an elongated, streamlined vertical form. Here in highly polished bronze, but the original that he made was actually made of marble, and so then it wasn't cast until later in bronze. Um, but the form really looks nothing like the bird that the title implies is the subject, but the elegant sort of uplifting nature of the form does have a certain sense of weightlessness that perhaps implies the idea of flight, or maybe a feather sort of floating slowly down to earth, or perhaps even the extreme speed and agility of a bird of prey. Um, so again, he's not trying to depict, you know, naturalized or representational forms. He's instead trying to capture the essence of these forms. Um, and again, the sleek form here has been juxtaposed with a more roughly carved um, stone pedestal in this case, contrasting ideas of modern industrialization with simplified primitivism.